They say space is the future. Out among the countless billions and billions of new worlds in our galaxy, but a journey needs a path or road, so what sort of roads will we build in space? Underneath almost every house or building, humble or grand, is a foundation and often a driveway to a road, power lines, water lines, sewer, telephone, cable, internet, and more. There are roads and rails, highways, airports and train stations, pipelines and high voltage cables, cell phone and Wi Fi networks, seaports, water treatment facilities, power plants, hospitals, schools, police and fire stations, banks and ATMs, mints and now even crypto mines, parks and walkways, software updates, hiking and biking trails, and so many more. These are but a sample of the infrastructure that our civilization on this planet runs on. And I thought we would ask what that looks like at the interplanetary scale, as our civilization spreads out to other major planets, moons, and millions of minor planets and asteroids orbiting our shared Sun. At the core, infrastructure is the facilities or systems that serve some place, be it a tiny village or whole country, and which are needed for its economy, homes, people, groups, and businesses to function, or at least to function as they are. We can obviously function without the internet, I still remember a time before it and I am only 42, but it's hard to imagine our civilization functioning without it anymore and I don't think it would really be the current civilization without it. Maintaining the internet or platforms like Wikipedia or YouTube in space would be no mean feat, but it would be just as vital as now and includes whole new problems. One of the ironies of space is that this era of instant communication is likely to be a short-lived period unless we find some method of communicating faster than light, which is in contradiction to our current understanding of physics. In such a case, as the volume of inhabited space increases, we might return to an earlier era where messages were carried by ships and a response would take several weeks. Fortunately, everything in this solar system is still inside contact times shorter than what was routine in most nations prior to modern telecommunications. The basic ability to pass information between people and groups is perhaps the most foundational aspect of infrastructure, and so we can imagine the whole solar system being knit together to one degree or another, much as Earth has been in recent centuries, though hopefully more peacefully, respectfully, and productively than has often been the case. This would not seem as much an option at the interstellar scale, let alone at the galactic level, and we may contemplate those scenarios more another day, but it's beyond our current scope. It is also impossible to detail every bit of infrastructure we have now on Earth, even briefly, in a single episode, let alone everything a new interplanetary civilization might need, but our goal today is to talk about some of the more unique, vital, or interesting ones. Some may never come to pass, some might only exist far ahead in time or only now for a century or two before being primarily replaced by something better, much as canals are mostly a thing of the past. For instance, we may one day build enormous tethers directly connecting huge orbital rings along planetary orbital paths to allow direct physical travel on a train between planets. More on that later, but something like that would come long after more simple approaches such as the Aldrin Cycler, a large space station or even converted asteroid that orbits on a path that routinely takes it past two planets, like Earth and Mars, allowing transport between them by hitchhiking along. So today we'll be contemplating everything from simple early systems like the Hohmann Transfer cosmic train schedule to swarms of constructs so big they would dwarf Earth itself and to do that in a single episode, we will often reference other episodes we've done, like the Megastructural Compendium, where we discussed a given structure in more detail, some of which eclipse entire stars or solar systems in scope. And if those sound like fun, make sure to check them out afterward and hit the like and subscribe buttons for alerts when more mind-bending content like them comes out. Now there are a lot of ways to view infrastructure, but we probably ought to start with the basic ones for getting us off Earth or other high gravity planets, and sadly that's probably not rockets, cool though they are. If you're looking to move millions of people to orbit and back every single day, and millions of tons of cargo, thousands of ships slamming through the air at hypersonic speeds is not your optimal way to do that. 
Rather, that's where concepts like space elevators and orbital or tethered rings come into play, or mass drivers or skyhooks or rotovators or launch loops. Now we have detailed all of these in either our Upward Bound series or MIG structures, with most having their own dedicated episode, so we will just summarize operation and role for now. The space elevator is the most commonly known megastructure for getting into space and it is a very long tether, tens of thousands of miles or kilometers long, and it not only gets you up to orbital space but roaring around at orbital speeds, or even above it at highest altitudes. Contrary to their common portrayal, it is not necessary to have a space elevator leave from the equator, assuming you instead have multiple tethers meet up from both hemispheres at the same stational waypoint that itself is over the equator. This is handy as the amount of traffic they can handle at the same time is very limited by tether strength, and it is a very long journey to geosynchronous orbit or higher. This also means that one could leave directly from a city rather than an equatorial port, as the vehicles climbing them are not rockets, they also could be departing direct from cities without noise or damage issues, they could easily include a parachute in case they fell off. The same is true of climbers on the elevator cables up to an orbital ring. This would allow you to skip the journey of tens of thousands of kilometers to geo altitudes in favor of a journey of just hundreds of kilometers to leo altitudes. You are not at orbital speed when you reach the top of the elevator, just at orbital altitude, but you can then launch from there by using a mass driver, circumventing the atmospheric drag or need for a large rocket, and saving vast amounts of money. A tethered ring would be at an even lower altitude, just tens of kilometers above the Earth's surface. With a tethered ring, the mass driver for space launch is installed on the ground, and the ring supports an evacuated tube that vehicles travel through to avoid air drag issues within the densest part of the atmosphere. With all of these approaches, the mass driver tends to operate on the same fundamental premise, we use a long track to accelerate the vehicle up to orbital velocities electromagnetically. When launching from a planet with an atmosphere, like Earth, we either install the entire mass driver above the atmosphere, as is the case for orbital rings or lostrum loops, or we install the mass driver on the ground and use the active support structure to support an evacuated tube, as is the case for the tethered ring, or one supported by space towers. We discuss many variations of these systems and others like space planes, along with their science and pros and cons, in other episodes, again principally in our Upward Bound series, but it always comes back to the same simple paradigm. Rockets are your covered wagons for reaching the frontier. Once you have and are building that frontier up, that's when you start getting into space in your equivalent of freeways and railroads. I'm most partial to tether-based systems and inertially supported active structures in particular as they require no new science or materials, though better magnetic shielding, energy production, or superconductors sure help. They allow a tether of mundane carbon fiber or Kevlar or several other strong substances to drop down or at an angle to potentially any city or airport on the planet and for a conventional, though airtight, tram-like car to run up that tether or multiple tethers for redundancy, to the ring in the upper atmosphere. That ring is held up by seeming magic, but in fact it's the mundane physics of active support and conservation of momentum for orbital rings or the tethered ring. The tethered ring, which seemingly paradoxically hangs itself in the air from the ground, feels like magic on first glance too, but this is no difference than a guy wire to a tower, but works because the planet is a sphere. In both cases a ring can be placed at many locations, not just the equator, but the equator is easier for an orbital ring. Cables or Jacob's Ladders, as Paul Borch referred to them, down to the ground can anchor it against precession, allowing us to tilt the thing to run on a path over any two spots on Earth we feel like, and all that's between them, and near them too since we can also put tram lines out to the sides to run down at an angle, allowing one ring to service a wide ribbon of land around the planet. Another ring just a few hundred feet higher or lower can cross the force, connect by a cable to it, and service a different ribbon ring of the Earth at a different angle. And more rings can be added as needed until you have fast space access from any place on the planet, and from any point on the planet to another. They are very sturdy cables, you can run a power cord along those to a ground side reactor or have solar panels hanging off the side, and maybe even beam energy in from space-based solar satellites. 
That energy powers the climbers, which may move at whatever speed they like up the tether for a trip of tens of miles or kilometers. I'd imagine they would speed up after getting away from cities and above local landscape and air traffic, but likely would not exceed Mach 1, just to minimize engineering issues and local noise problems, so you might spend 10 or 20 minutes getting to the ring. Once there, you can essentially travel along the ring in the vacuum of space to reach a destination halfway around the planet in under an hour. Note that Transdata Tethered Ring Transit System would be slower than an Orbital Ring Transit System since you would be traveling at subsonic speeds through a high altitude helium or hydrogen filled tube, but since the speed of sound in low pressure helium is around 3500 km per hour and for hydrogen it's 4500 km per hour, you would still be able to travel at 3-4 to four times the speed of air travel today. On an Orbital Ring it's limited only by the acceleration people are comfortable with which includes the centrifugal force of turning around the planet. It's hard to say what your time to the local station would be, or from your terminus station to your final destination, or transfer times at each layover, but it makes a very plausible case for transfer from any spot on the planet to another, door to door, in only a few hours. Cheaply too, for a person or for cargo. That's what's awesome about these ideas not just their space launching capacity, allowing millions of people and millions of tons of cargo to move to and from orbit every day and cheaply, but potentially allowing millions or billions of people and tons of cargo to move around the planet in a fraction of a day for a fraction of modern costs. As part of our interplanetary infrastructure, these systems also offer massive economic boons to the planet, ours or any we settle, and that's why I like them along with cheap orbital launch requiring no new science. It is much easier to fund, build, improve, and maintain a space launcher that also has vast and direct benefits to us down here on Earth. You leave LA and are in London or Tokyo two hours later to visit the family for the weekend or attend a business trip. You can live in New York City and commute half an hour to the orbital ring in space you work at each day and still be home in time for dinner ultra-safe, ultra-reliable, ultra-cheap. On already airless worlds, which is most of them, such transport systems are much easier to install. Indeed most airless worlds have very low gravity and they are easy to burrow through or build tall structures up from. And yet it is likely going to be a long while before we can build these structures. Some new asteroid mine or dome on Mars is unlikely to have the people and resources to justify a lot of infrastructure of this type. That said, we should be mindful that our own enormous modern infrastructure would be unimaginable even a couple centuries ago, when cobbling a road was something requiring work gangs of dozens to make the bricks and lay them for even a short stretch, having a paved driveway to your own house was a mark of extreme wealth that even most mansions lacked. Technology and automation make it vastly easier to create infrastructure, and so it might not be that absurd to imagine an underground vacuum tunnel directly to the average person's house in centuries to come, and it's certainly easier to do on airless rocks with low gravity. So too, transforming those rocks into vast habitats where we have literally built everything including the ground under our feet may not be so difficult in a civilization with superior automation and power production. Indeed they may not need to get much better than we are right now, just a bit more practiced. There are tens of millions of minor planets in our solar system, ranging from rocks 100 meters across that might become a village or family space farm, to those which dwarf even large nations, and which might collectively be transformed into far more living space than what we have on Earth. In early days on Earth, humans tend to take advantage of local natural shelter like caves and build homes later and Earth itself is like that, a handy but not terribly efficient use of mass for living space. A given mountain might have enough caves to let many hundreds shelter during bad weather or cold seasons and even be expanded to house thousands by digging them out, but you could take that same rock and build untoward millions of homes. In this same way, asteroids and smaller moons can be turned into huge amounts of artificial living habitats, such as O'Neill cylinders and other pieces of infrastructure like extensive solar collectors or titanic orbital industries. Many an asteroid, essentially a lifeless mountain-sized rock floating in space, may get its beginning as an asteroid mine and use its income over many decades or centuries to transform that lifeless rock into a small nation with a more diverse economy. 
but what about travel between all those rocks? Here we have a number of possible options that range between your covered wagon and your airport or freeway. You might one day need or have the resources for something ultra fast, but early on you start simple and low energy, and in many cases will keep to that, much their own biggest shipping vessels carrying non-spoilable goods like metal ore or oil tend to move not much quicker than old sailing ships, in an era where supersonic travel is possible. The Hohmann Transfer is an example of a very low energy and slow move, at least by interplanetary terms, that we use nowadays to get spacecraft from point A to point B, and it never looks at all like the straight line we usually think of as the quickest way between two places. Everything orbiting the Sun does so at a specific speed and energy, and the further from the Sun you are, the slower you orbit both in terms of your raw speed and, since your orbital path is much wider, the period it takes you to get there. For instance, Mars is about 154% further from the Sun than Earth is, and moves at 81% of Earth's speed around the Sun, 15 miles per second instead of 18.5. As a result, it must cover 154% of the distance around the Sun while doing it at 81% of the speed, and this results in a year of 188% longer than our own but it also means something leaving Earth, while it will lose speed moving away from the Sun's gravity, needs to be moving at the right speed to reach Mars but also not so fast as to need to burn much fuel to enter an orbit of Mars. That spacecraft will also accelerate as it approaches that planet, pulled on by that gravity, so your range of speeds to avoid flying right past that planet and slingshotting off in a new direction rather than entering orbit is smaller than one might think. This is true of essentially every cosmic body we send spacecraft to, it is even harder in the case of asteroids because they have so little gravity. Little fuel is needed to escape from them, but entering orbit around one requires extreme patience and precision. However, every planet or minor planet has optimal launch windows that allow for patient and minimal fuel use to get to them. There are usually a few options too, depending on how much fuel you're willing to burn. The most fuel efficient is called the Hohmann Transfer Orbit, and in the case of Mars it is 517 days in orbit, half spent traveling there for 259 days. Travel between Earth and every other object, and also between those objects to each other, is possible and in general we call this the Cosmic Train Schedule. We can also aid some journeys by traveling to other planets first in multiple steps and slingshots, and potentially aiding these with various megastructures like rotovators or mass drivers or energy and particle beams. But this is how we travel now, or sometimes using one of the slightly higher fuel-borne options. Getting to Mars with people is a rations and radiation issue, so speed matters. There are options for traveling to Mars faster at different paths and speeds, they tend to require more fuel or different types of prototype engines. But one handy thing about planets with atmospheres is that you can aerobreak away excess speed on arrival, so you don't necessarily need to burn fuel both up and down from your cruising speed. It is very likely that some asteroid mine in the belt may have to wait for good windows to ship ore and metals to Earth. They might find a slow, low fuel option to be profitable even with faster options available. After all, does it matter if you're mining for centuries at a steady and expected rate and shipping metals back to a commodity market that can easily forecast demand and uses most of that demand for titanic structures that probably take decades to build? One slightly superior option is to either build a large space station or find a small near-Earth asteroid and to nudge it onto a more elliptical orbit that regularly passes by your two objects. In the case of Earth and Mars, and the basic Aldrin Cycler, this is typically a bit over a two-year orbit that permits an Earth to Mars trip of 146 days and the same on the way back. Much of that time in between each leg is spent out further past Mars. We can arrange similar cyclers to other bodies too, like Earth to Jupiter or Mars to Venus and so on. It's not hard to imagine these sorts of cycler craft, potentially several to the same destination on different schedules, serving a major infrastructural role, even in energy-abundant interplanetary civilizations. In theory, you can get to Mars in mere days with sufficient energy, and pretty much anywhere in the solar system in a few weeks, by accelerating at 1G and flipping over the half point to decelerate, turn and burn maneuvers as it's sometimes called. This is popular in sci-fi but in practice it is hard to imagine anyone being that wasteful with fuel, and moreover that is not a limit since you could accelerate at a higher rate. 
it would just be uncomfortable for most humans, and unhealthy if you went too high. Infrastructure such as large propulsive lasers or energy beams that reflect off ships' light sails or power relativistic ion drives might allow economical travel around the solar system at speeds an order of magnitude higher than planetary orbital speeds, which means travel paths closer to straight lines and journey times of weeks or months rather than years or decades. We can also skip on rocket fuel and launch at very high speeds from larger orbital rings or very long linear accelerators like a mass driver. One built out beyond geosynchronous altitudes could launch ships at those sorts of speeds too, though slowing down the other end probably could not be accomplished by landing on such a strip. Shooting a bullet down a barrel is a lot easier than catching one in a barrel, even if technically possible. There is a standing concern on whether an accelerator like this can switch its electromagnets fast enough to push it at higher speeds, but my friend Phil Swan from the Atlantis Project came up with a neat solution of using turning screw shafts down the length as opposed to using the normal switching system, and as best as he, I, or anyone else I know who's looked at it can tell, it seems to circumvent that problem. If you like the details, I'll link to his presentation on the topic and his channel, Space Infrastructure, discusses many of the ideas in greater depth. Phil incidentally came up with the tethered ring design and ran the new interplanetary infrastructure session that inspired this episode at our most recent International Space Development Conference hosted by the National Space Society. Space is big and needs big ideas from smart folks to tackle it. Conferences like the ISDC are great places for people to share and discuss them, and it is a very great honor to be serving as the National Space Society's president, just like getting to run this show in our social media forums and hoping to introduce these ideas to others who might one day help make them. I know they can seem enormous and unbelievable at times, like towers taller than freeways all along, or giant rings that hold themselves in the sky, and some might turn out to be impractical but I never cease to be impressed by what people come up with and how often we make those dreams a reality. Some of those dreams come from conferences like the ISDC, some from online forums like the ones we have on Facebook, Reddit, and Discord, and it's inspiring to see so many of them. In the long term, we might even build orbital rings of various diameters around the sun. We could travel between them on cables that resemble the spokes on a bicycle wheel, but the ends of those spokes would not be directly attached to the rings but would instead couple magnetically to them and glide over them. A system comprising hundreds of rings built about a million kilometers apart, all interconnected with free-floating spokes and outfitted with lots of maglev tracks and mass drivers might become the interplanetary equivalent of a terrestrial interstate highway system. Vehicles could race up from Earth's surface, out to a ring, up a tether to another ring, and out and over and over until coming to a stop on Mars or Jupiter or Venus or even Pluto. A sufficiently advanced civilization, even without FTL, probably has some very high speed options available if they are transhuman or post-biological, like beaming over a copy of someone's brain at light speed or whole data copy of their body, although probably very compressed, that's something we discussed more in our episode on teleportation. But speaking of beaming, I think this becomes a more dominant part of system infrastructure as you get bigger. You have the whole sun's power output to work with, trillions of times what we currently use, not to mention managing its waste heat and moving around to where it's needed. Space habs are likely to have their own constellation of sunlight collectors and pushing beams to facilitate slowing or speeding ships visiting them and to power their own industry, agriculture, and civilization. Very complex networks, which may require complex coordination too, may exist throughout the solar system for beaming energy and pushing ships around safely and efficiently. Same for information, they may also need individual archives or libraries on every habitat, or share them with neighbors or have a mix, storing some websites locally and others further away at bigger nodes. We do have the option of moving a lot of power and communication around this solar system and potentially finding ourselves having to lay physical cables down, like fiber optics, just to avoid having the solar system flooded with comm traffic and power transmission. In the short term though, one thing we have to keep in mind is that simple size is not a very good indicator of effort to build. A solar collector the size of this planet might mass a lot less than a single mountain or minor asteroid being so thin and so too would a solar shade or mirror that blocked or reflected sunlight. For that matter, you can also use power beams for terraforming effects. 
But for scale, we should also keep in mind that in the future, a lot of production might be about designing an object than having machines build it, so the complexity matters more than size. Indeed for many things this is already true, and it lets us contemplate planet-sized projects. I think it is very likely that places like Mars or Venus will adjust their temperatures by having large numbers of such meals or shades either in orbit or at their Lagrange point, and you can also use this to artificially alter apparent day length. That's handy on a place like Venus or Mercury where the sunrise is something that happens every several months, not every day. These sorts of ultra-thin shades or mirrors allow us to terraform even super-hot planets or concentrate sunlight to warm even planets so cold air turns into a liquid. But perhaps more importantly, those Lagrange points become major locations of infrastructure as the solar system grows, especially the L1 and L2 points. For any two orbiting bodies, like the Moon and Earth or Earth and Sun, there's a point directly between them, usually much closer to the smaller of the pair, where the gravity of that smaller body decreases the pool of the larger one just enough to make a spot where the orbital period is the same as the smaller body has. Normally the closer the Sun you are, the greater the Sun's gravity, the faster your orbital period must be, but right there at the L1 point it's just a little diminished to be just right to lag behind and travel with Earth. On the other side of Earth you have the L2, where Earth's gravity combines with the Sun to make gravity there just a bit stronger, resulting in a faster orbital period and one that keeps up with Earth. These are a bit under a million miles from Earth toward or away from the Sun, or 1.5 million kilometers. These are not points of no gravity, just diminished or increased gravity in one direction, the Earth opposing or lining up. Something similar happens at L4 and L5, which each form an equilateral triangle with Earth and the Sun, 60 degrees ahead or behind us in orbit. L3 is on the exact opposite side of the Earth from the Sun, 180 degrees ahead in orbit, sometimes called the Counter-Earth Location. All these points are very handy locations for infrastructure, like those designed to bring in energy or manage incoming sunlight, or just handy for staying near Earth. None of these are stable, requiring station keeping, and every two-body system has them, some are more stable than others. L4 and L5 for instance are places that should orbit just like Earth, as should anything on that path, but if we put something at, say, 30 degrees out from Earth, not 60, it would be tugged ever so slightly toward Earth until eventually falling into it. It does not take much to stop that though, and a secondary effect of various mirrors and shades and power collectors is that they do act like solar sails, a simple and weak but effective means of moving a ship or providing station keeping for a large station or habitat. This means we can put a lot of things in this area, expanding out from Earth in those L4 and L5 spots, and you can connect those together with physical tethers to not only provide easy transport, power, and data lines, but also balancing out the tugging forces to need even less net station keeping. You might keep doing this until you end up with a ring of stations all around Earth's orbital path, even as Earth's own orbital region and cislunar space filled up with large space habitats, providing land and living space, and farms and ecological preserves, tens of thousands of times more than Earth has now. We sometimes call this a planet swarm as opposed to a Dyson swarm, a vast collection of habitats near a planet that are something like its suburbs, and you might construct a direct physical tether out from this to all those habitats or space farms and solar collectors that were forming on Earth's orbital path, potentially forming what we nickname a Terran Ring, a huge ring or torus of megastructures around the Sun that rotate with our planet and which along with its swarms of habitats looks something like a gemstone on that ring. All of those places could be physically connected, under known science, running power and data or people and cargo on vast trunk lines dwarfing any highway we've ever built, and potentially home to quadrillions, none of whom feel cramped as it would have a far lower population density than modern Earth. This may be the natural in-between state that forms between an early spacefaring civilization and an eventual Dyson Swarm encompassing that whole star, and reaching the end of what I think the term interplanetary infrastructure could contemplate. A civilization already so immense, if still small compared to a Dyson Swarm, that it would need to keep whole oceans moving through its cisterns to drink, and ships the size of cities or railroad trains as long as continents to move its cargo around. And if it's hard for us to contemplate infrastructure at such a scale, and how impressive it is, 
it is almost impossible to imagine what feats and wonders the civilization built upon it might accomplish. To build all those enormous pieces of interplanetary infrastructure we discussed today, we'll require vast amounts of raw materials, and ideally we would like to harvest those from asteroids, and while we discussed that process before, I thought it'd be interesting to explore the life of an asteroid miner, to ask what that would be like, and what folks might be motivated to that career. That's out now exclusively on Nebula, our streaming service, where we release a lot of bonus content, extra episodes and extended editions, and where every regular episode of the show also comes out ad-free and a few days early. By signing up for Nebula at go.nebula.tv slash IsaacArthur, and using code IsaacArthur, you get access to bonus content like Life as an Asteroid Miner, Nomadic Miners on the Moon, Space Freighters, Retro Causality, Orc OR and Free Will, Conformal Cyclic Cosmology, Colonizing Binary Stars, and more. Using my link and discount, it's available now for just over $2.50 a month, less than the price of the drink or snack you might have been enjoying during the episode. However, this month, September 2023, you can also get a lifetime membership to Nebula, for as long as both you and Nebula exist, for $300 which goes to developing more and bigger Nebula originals and platform improvements, and if you sign up using my code, IsaacArthur, a third of that goes directly to the channel, and I'll place the link for that option in the description right under the normal one. Either way you join Nebula you get access to all of our content, early and ad-free, including the audio-only podcast, and access to tons of bonus content from our show and many other amazing creators. As I mentioned during the episode, the National Space Society's track on interplanetary infrastructure at ISDC 2023 inspired me to write this episode and particularly conversations with Phil Swan, who ran that track and did several of the tethered and orbital ring animations we had up today, and if you're interested in learning more about that, playing with the actual computer model those graphics came from to build your own rings, you can learn more at ProjectAtlantis.com. We talked about megastructures a lot today and I think that's a very appropriate way to end our ninth year here on YouTube, as our first episode, Megastructures in Space, Science and Science Fiction, came out on September 17th of 2014, and we'll be celebrating that ninth anniversary of SFIA this weekend in our Sci-Fi Sunday episode, The Fermi Paradox, Fallen Empires, where we'll try to contemplate what the ruins of ancient galactic empires and megastructures might look like if floating around the galaxy a billion years later. Then Thursday, September 21st, we'll start year 10 off by asking how we can mine atmospheres like those on Venus or Titan, or even gas giants and stars. After that we'll close out the month with our livestream Q&A on Sunday, September 24th, and then on the 28th, we'll have an exploration of what traveling the galaxy as an adventurer or lone wanderer will be like in Have Spacesuit, Will Travel. Then we'll jump into October to explain what vacuum and zero point energy are on October 5th, and then we'll have an episode not on spaceships but the factories that will make them on October 12th. And to continue today's topic of infrastructure and industry in space, stay tuned for our next Sci-Fi Sunday on October 15th where we'll contemplate entire planets turned into giant factories in Forge Worlds and Industrial Planets. If you'd like to get alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to hit the like, subscribe, and notification buttons. You can also support the show on Patreon, and if you want to donate and help in other ways, you can see those options by visiting our website, IsaacArthur.net. You can also catch all of SFIA's episodes early and ad-free on our streaming service Nebula, along with hours of bonus content at go.nebula.tv slash As always, thanks for watching and have a great week.